go. And, and, and officially welcome all of you to what is Tin Mountain's final nature programs of um, 2021. Uh, so thank you for joining us for this program. Um, before I turn things over to Katie and the topic for this evening, I first want to th take a moment to thank Tin Mountain's Nature Program Series sponsors, um, and they are Hancock Lumber, White Mountain Oil and Propane, and Ragged Mountain Equipment. So I want to recognize them for their financial support that allows us to continue providing um, this type of programming. I also want to thank all of you who are watching who are current members of Tin Mountain Conservation Center. Your membership dollars also go towards helping us fulfill our mission and continue to offer these quality programs. Um, and if you're not a member, I would encourage you to do so. And if being a member right now is not the right fit, um, right on our website in the top right-hand corner, um, there is a support us button and you can donate to our nature programs, um, if that's something that works for you at this time. Um, a few upcoming programs as we look ahead to 2022, we have a lot of great programs um, that are coming up. Um, we do also have, as this is often you know, um, you know, the refresher for, um, is the, um, is the Christmas bird count. Our 33rd annual North Conway area Christmas bird count will be happening um, this Saturday, the 18th. Um, but then as we move into 2022, um, we are starting our first program of the year will be our environmental book club monthly read. Um, that's on Wednesday, January 5th. Um, and our January read is Finding the Mother Tree. Um, then on Saturday, January 8th, we actually have a coastal birding trip that's what we're heading down to the pool um, in search of some coastal winter birds. Um, and then on Thursday, um, January 13th, we have our first, uh, we have our first evening program of the year. Um, and we actually have uh, Georgia Murray, one of the scientists at the Appalachian Mountain Club, will be presenting their recent findings on climate change in the White Mountains. Um, so that's something to look forward to. Lots of great programs that we have um, in the future. Again, before I hand things over to Katie, just quick, um, you know, programming etiquette. If you haven't joined us before, or if it's been a while, one, um, if you want to go ahead and mute yourself so that we don't pick up background noise. Um, if you have questions during the program, the best place to ask those is to type them into the chat at the bottom of your screen. Um, I will be monitoring that. And if it's an immediate clarifying question, I can hop in and um, I can hop in and uh, you know, and ask that of Katie. Otherwise, I will go through and read those at the end of the program. At which point, you are also welcome to unmute yourself, um, and and ask you know, ask those questions yourself. Oh, there you're right. Yes, <laughs> that's that's my spiel. Um, so we are, as I said, excited. Um, winter bird ecology is an annual program here at Tin Mountain. And um, we're actually really excited because this is the first time we have had our resident bird intern present the program, which is very exciting. So we have Katie Gearlinger, who has been with us since um, who has been with us since the spring. Um, and she was busy here all, all summer in the field season and she will, she's staying with us through uh, the end of next field season. So um, we are happy to have her here and presenting. So I am going to go ahead and hand things over to Katie. All right, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Hopefully it came up properly. All set, all right. Well, thank you, Nora, for that. And as we said earlier, this is the 33rd Christmas bird count in North Conway. And Tin Mountain hosts this 
uh, presentation every year to kind of help brush up on everyone's winter bird ID. Some of the birds will probably see during the count. Forgive me, I'm just adjusting my screen real quick. There we go. All right, so to start off, I guess one of the big things we like to ask is why go winter birding? Winter definitely isn't everyone's favorite season. I will say it is my favorite season. So this is my favorite time to go birding. I'm a huge advocate for it. Um, one of the big things is it's a unique time to go hiking, beautiful landscapes, uh, lots of birds you can see, especially in the White Mountains. We have these higher elevations. You can see some unique species up there. Um, but if you don't wanna go out in the woods, you know, you can always do it from your home. Feeders are a big thing uh, during the winter time. I know up here, I'm from Western New York, so we don't typically have the issue with um, bears getting into our bird feeders. But I know up here during winter time, you're able to bring them out. Although we're still having issues with bears getting into our feeders right now. I guess they haven't quite started hibernating. Um, and another big one is if you have a lot of big luscious gardens, birds love to take cover in there. If you've got fruit trees, they'll come hang around your yard. Lots of fun. And again, beautiful backdrops. My, I love to photograph during the winter time. The picture on the right is one of mine from back home. This is a little dark-eyed junco, one of my favorite birds to take pictures of during the winter. And it was after a night, we got a half foot of snow, as you can see on that little birdhouse. Beautiful backdrops. Uh, you get those bright red cardinals, one of our famous winter birds. Uh, definitely one of my favorite times to go uh, photo photographing. And again, we get these winter migrants. When we think migration, a lot of times we think birds leaving during fall to go south and escape the winter. But one of the unique things is we actually get migrants from way up north in like the Arctic and Canada who stop in the northern USA and this is their southerly range. So we'll get some unique individuals that we will only see during the winter time. And finally, winter to birding is kind of a testament to the resiliency and the adaptability of birds. I mean, they're out there surviving. There's a foot of snow, they've got to find food. Sometimes we have blizzard nights. How do they survive? How do they keep warm? How do they find food? But they're thriving out there. So they've definitely got their own ways, which kind of leads us into part of our title is ecology. And ecology is defined as the relationships between organisms and their environment, but also the relationships between animals and other animals. So birds and birds and that sort of thing. A lot of times birds have different life strategies that help them survive through the winter as well as different winter behaviors. And this will just help them make it through those hard times while other birds choose to go south because they do not have those adaptations to survive up here during the snow. So another big um, thing that happens with winter birding is the Christmas bird count. And again, this is North Conway's 33rd year of doing the Christmas bird count but it's actually the 122nd bird, Christmas bird count in the Western hemisphere. So this side of the globe. This has been going on since 1900 on Christmas day when it was started by the ornithologist Frank M. Chapman as well as 26 other uh, conservationists. They decided instead of hunting birds which was the tradition on Christmas day to see how many birds people can hunt. Why don't we count birds, you know? Conservation was a big up and coming thing. So they decided to switch it up. We'd rather protect the birds and see how many there are than harvest them. Uh, the initial Christmas bird count had 25 locations and it spread all the way from Toronto, Canada, all the way down to Pacific Grove, California. Um, and in total in that single day, they counted 18,500 birds um, across 89 species, which is a lot for only 25 locations. And interestingly enough, Keene, New Hampshire was one of those first locations. And there is a Christmas bird count circle in that area that's been going on since then. And again, this is one of the longest running citizen science programs. So citizen science programs are these uh, initiatives that people, regular people like you and me, we go out and we see birds, we record what we find, and then we submit the data into say it's Cornell, or like to Tin Mountain, and then we save this research for other scientists to use in conservation efforts. Um, the modern day CBC, CBC stands for Christmas Bird Count, by the way, um, takes place anywhere from December 14th to January 5th. Ours is going on December 18th. There may be other bird counts going on in New Hampshire on other days. Um, typically they do take place on weekends because it is easier 
But these uh, circles are 15 miles in diameter and they're led by a compiler. The North Conway one is led by Tin Mountain. And those compilers kind of set everyone up on their routes. Some people have homes within the count circle and they can do counts from their feeders, but all of the data gets sent back to this compiler so they can organize the data and send it in. But basically you're counting every bird you can see in here all day long. On the right is another picture I took from my feeder back home. This is a male downy woodpecker, a common visitor to our backyard feeders. So get, getting into uh, some figures here, the one on the left is a little grainy. It's an older picture from the New Hampshire bird records. But as we can see from this arrow right here, this is the North Conway circle we were talking about. But in the bottom right, I hope you can, bottom left, I hope you can see my cursor. I forgot to put an arrow on this one, but this is that keen New Hampshire circle down here. That one's been going on for well over a century. Um, and then on the right, we have our circle blown up, which is split up into four areas with North Conway, Chase, oh gosh, we just went over the pronunciation, Chatham, forgive me, Bartlett, and then area four on the left there. These little orange circles I have highlighted are a couple uh, unique spots where the elevation is higher than 800 feet. These ones are kind of of note because you'll find certain, you may find boreal species up there that you won't typically find in the lower elevations. And another figure that was uh, produced by Tin Mountain is there are species ratios over the past 31 years of Christmas bird counts. As you can see, a large chunk of it is black capped chickadees. One of our most common birds, we see them all year round. It's one of the first birds a lot of people learn. Um, and they're close, they're huh, not closely followed, but followed by blue jays and American goldfinches. And I'm sure a lot of us recognize the other names throughout this uh, pie chart. So kind of getting into a little bit of why are these projects important? The CBC, the Breeding Bird Survey, Feeder Watch, Nest Watch. I don't know if you've heard of those last two, Cornell hosts them. Um, all of these are citizen science programs that are basically the backbone of their data is citizen scientists like yourselves. So these are incredibly important because they track data and population over time. These long-term uh, data sets are incredibly vital for conservation efforts. They help us see how bird populations are being changed from previous years into current centuries and everything. And they help conservationists decide who needs to be protected immediately and who needs to be protected in the long run. Uh, the Christmas bird count alone has contributed to over 300 peer-reviewed papers, uh, the EPA climate change reports, as well as numerous federal conservation efforts alongside like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, who brings the state of the birds every year. One final group I want to discuss that's kind of unique among our winter forecasts is the winter winter finches and eruptive owls. So these guys, I actually, from my hometown, we don't typically get a lot of them. So coming up to New Hampshire, it was fun listening about these winter finch forecasts because they come, these are these migrants that come down from Canada and the Arctic into our area occasionally. Uh, eruption is defined as a mass migration in response to food resources to areas where they are not typically seen. So these guys, a lot of birds will have ranges where you'll see them year round, during the winter or during breeding season. These guys kind of, depending on the food, food sources up north, they may show up further south or they may not one year. Last year I heard was a good uh, year for evening grosbeaks and pine siskins. This year, uh, further on, I'll talk more about the winter finch forecast, but it's not sounding like too much of an eruptive year, but we could see some of these guys. All in all, apparently it's, it's like spring and winter. You'll get flocks of these guys uh, coming to your feeders or through the woods, and it's suddenly like these quiet forests are coming alive with all these birds. Doesn't even feel like winter. Some examples of these eruptive finches are some grosbeaks, the pine siskins. We've got our red poles, uh, finches like the purple finch. Um, crossbills, and then uh, bohemian waxwings are also included in these groups, but they're not a finch. They are an eruptive passerine though, so an eruptive songbird, so they are included in these forecasts. And then the red-breasted nuthatch, who is typically in this area year-round, but sometimes they get large uh, groups of them that will head further south. And then finally, on the right, we've got our snowy owl. These guys are both famous and infamous in the birding community. When we hear about one of these guys, 
I am sorry if you hear that phone in the background. I in, am in Tin Mountain's office. <laughs> Uh, these guys are famous because when you hear about a snowy owl alert, everyone flocks to see them, but they're kind of infamous because they have produced um, things such as snowy owl ethical birding. These guys can get stressed very easily if we encroach on them a little too much and that sort of thing. But some other eruptive owls that we may see are like northern sawwets, great grays, and the following, like the boreal short-eared northern hawk owl, likely not going to see them, but I put them in there because they are very occasionally they'll show up out of nowhere. So getting into counting birds, like how do we count these birds? What should we look out for? Currently our forecast this weekend is looking like the low 30s. It's more likely to snow later in the afternoon. So hopefully it'll be a good day. It might be kind of windy. If it stays in the low 30s, we should just see snow. We shouldn't see a mix of like rain snow. So yes, dress warm, bring layers, change of clothes in case say your shoes get wet you wanna stay nice and warm. Another great thing to have with you at all times is binoculars in a field guide, as well as a method for recording what birds you're seeing and hearing. But another good example of an online field guide is Merlin. This is a bird app, which does take a little bit of time and uh, data to download, but it's definitely handy to have if you don't wanna carry around a book. Uh, getting a little bit into our identification. So one of the things we will really wanna be looking out for is their call notes. During the summertime, birds will sing to defend territory, find a mate, but in the wintertime, they don't need to worry about that. So typically they're not singing. And so we differentiate them a little bit more from their call notes, which can be difficult, but with practice, they are able, you are able to get the hang of it. And again, our field markings. So what are you looking for when you see a bird? On the right, we've got our black cap chickadee. We all recognize him very easily by his black cap and his little black bib, but some birds have say non-breeding plumage. Uh, our American goldfinch is a good example. The males during the summertime have that bright, beautiful yellow plumage with the black cap, but in the winter, they look very similar to females. They get very dull uh, and they, the male and female look almost exactly the same. So it's just another thing to keep in mind is that birds may look different during the summer than they do in the winter. Another one to look out for is dimorphism. Uh, the northern cardinal is a really good example. Dimorphism means the males and the females look different. Uh, the male cardinal is red, while the female cardinal is a brown with like light, light red accents. And then finally, age. Sometimes you get birds who are in their first winter and they will look different than the adults, but the, a lot of times they'll mingle with the adults. And sometimes that helps with identification. Finally, we'll have our mixed flocks. This is one of my favorite things during the winter time when we're hiking through the woods and it's kind of quiet, but then you'll walk into a flock of birds and it's all these species hanging out together who typically would not do this during the summer when they're trying to defend territory. Uh, good examples of this are chickadees, nuthatches, downy woodpeckers, they'll all flock together alongside like tufted titmice. And it's just a lot of fun to listen to them hanging around in the trees. So, one of the things we want to figure out is with counting birds, you, if you know where you're going to be counting during this Christmas bird count, the types of habitats you're going to be looking at, you might be able to focus a little bit more on the birds in this presentation that apply more to you, but we do have an assortment just in case sometimes you get an oddball coming in every now and then. So to start off, the bottom two I'm sure most of us recognize. On the bottom left, we have our black capped chickadee. In the bottom right, we have the tufted titmouse. These are the guys I said a lot of times will flock together during the winter. You'll see them at our feeders uh, very often alongside, say, dark-eyed juncos. But um, in the top left, we have our boreal chickadee. So in a previous figure where I had the, uh, the map of our count circle, those higher elevations, that's where someone may see a boreal chickadee, although they may drift down here. You never know. It's could happen, it's not impossible, but we're more likely to see them up in those higher elevations. Uh, these guys are differentiated from the black caps by the obvious, they have the brown cap instead of a black cap on them. And then their call is a little bit different, which I will be playing a couple of calls throughout this presentation. So hopefully the sound comes through well enough. And then our last member on this slide is in the top right. We've got our golden crowned kinglet. I don't know if anyone here has seen them, but they are pretty common around here. They're here year round. They do tend to stick into those denser stands of conifers, um, especially high up. And usually you hear them before you see them. So I am going to play. 
play a couple of calls for of these guys real quick. So I'm just going to start off with the black cap chickadee. And while I said we want to focus more on their call notes, the black cap chickadee is a bird that occasionally will let out a part of their song. Most of us will probably recognize it right here. Very common. I hope that wasn't too loud. Um, but then some of their uh, recognizable calls is, of course, their unique chickadee call, which is right here. I likely didn't need to play these, but it's a good comparison for the Tufted Titmouse, who maybe you've seen this bird, but you didn't know it made calls. They have calls that are kind of similar to the chickadee call, but slightly different, and I'm going to play him right now. So theirs is a little bit raspier. It kind of follows that chickadee call, the pattern, but it's a little bit raspier and high pitched in the beginning. But another common sound we'll hear them make, uh, especially out in the woods is almost like a raspy fighting call. That's what I like to call it. It makes me think they're having a argument out in the woods. Very unique. Like if you hear that, you know for a fact it's a tufted tip mouse or two. Um, the golden crown kinglet, again, is the one you're probably going to hear him before you see him. He is one of our smallest passerines. You want to look for him in those dense conifer stands or way up high. But this is the call that he makes. So he's got a very high pitched kind of a seat call. Uh, usually they play them in groups of two or three kind of similar to the cedar waxwing, if you know what that is, but he breaks it up a little bit more. And finally, I'm just gonna play the uh, boreal chickadee call. It's very similar to the black cap chickadees, but it's a little harsher. And that was the boreal chickadee. So hopefully someone will get lucky to see one of those, one of those guys higher up um, if not, we can always take the chance and take a hike up the mountain anytime we want. Moving on into our nuthatches and creepers. I'm sure a lot of us recognize the guys on the right. In the top right, we have our white-breasted nuthatch, and below him is the red-breasted nuthatch. These two are definitely common backyard feeder birds, uh, the white-breasted more so than the red-breasted. The red-breasted are a little bit more shy, but if you've got suet, they'll definitely show up. But these two we'll see throughout the woods, off trails all the time. Um, they're here year round too. Interestingly enough, fun fact for me is back home where I'm from, Western New York, we actually don't really have red-breasted nut hatches. So I saw my first one when I came to New Hampshire. Um, and then on our left, we have the brown creeper. So these guys are described, um, I'm quoting it from Cornell because I loved how they phrased it, as a scrap of bark swirling up and down the tree. And they do, they have this beautiful camouflage along their back that you really don't see them until they start moving up and down the tree. Um, sometimes they'll come to feeders and backyards if you have suet, but unless you have these older trees hanging around your lawn, usually they'll stick to the woods. And I am going to play the nuthatch calls because these guys are very common in the woods and it's definitely good to know. Theirs are very similar, but they do have a little bit of differences between them. First, I'll play the white-breasted nuthatch. So I'm sure a lot of us recognize that call. Um, the way I equate it to is it sounds like someone's kind of laughing to themselves like, ha, 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 ha. that's the way I remember it. Uh, the red-breasted nuthatch is similar. It's more of a yank, I guess, and you'll, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So as you can see from there, I, I hear a yank in it. A lot of times they'll only do one or two yanks. The more there are, usually they're warning of uh, closer danger. Typically you hear one or two at a time. But between those two, the white-breasted nuthatch, I usually hear someone kind of laughing. And then the red-breasted, it's kind of like a yank, yank call. Now we're going to get into our sparrows. Uh, the nice thing about wintertime is there's not too many sparrows to tell apart because sparrows can't, are notoriously difficult sometimes. 
Uh, starting on the left, we've got our American tree sparrow. This is one of those winter migrants we were talking about. We don't see them during the summertime because they breed way, breed way up north, uh, but they come down into our range. All these guys on this slide are ground foragers. So lots of them will visit our feeders too. You'll find them on the ground typically while other birds are up on the feeders. But otherwise you'll see them kind of in the woods or in shrubby areas. Definitely keep your eyes peeled. Who knows when you'll see them. Uh, in the top center panel, we have our dark-eyed junco. He looks very different from all these other sparrows. The dark-eyed junco is my favorite winter bird. Most people, it's the northern cardinal. Mine is the dark-eyed junco. But these guys come down uh, south into our range in force from Canada and the Arctic. They are year-round residents around here, but a lot of times they'll retreat into higher elevations or the woods during the summertime. But when the winter comes around, They've been dubbed kind of the snowbird in North America. And we'll see them in big flocks around here and a lot of times at your feeders, in the woods, in shrubby areas, you'll see them all over the place. Uh, in the top right, we've got our house sparrow. So these guys were introduced uh, alongside the European starling and the rock pigeon, but these guys are very common, especially in urban or suburban areas. Um, I typically see them more so in towns than say in the woods, they've become very accustomed to humans, but they can show up at feeders uh, outside of that. Uh, the bottom right, this is the song sparrow. A lot of times they say, if you see a streaky brown bird, it's probably a song sparrow. They're very common in shrubby areas. Occasionally they'll vi visit winter feeders, um, but they're a little less common than the rest of these guys. And then the uh, bottom central panel, we've got our white-throated sparrow. He's very easy to pick out based on his yellow lures. Um, this is another unique bird and occasionally they will sing during the winter time. Um, I'm going to play his song so we kind of know because they will every now and then sing out their song. But a lot of times you'll find them in big flocks uh, on the ground near shrubby areas or in the woods. So let me just pull up a couple of these guys call notes. Oh, give me a moment, I'm so sorry. My tabs are not cooperating. Okay. So first I'm gonna play the American Tree Sparrow. His is definitely unique among the other guys. His is a little bit of like a Tweedledee, that's, that's what I hear. Again, it might be different for everyone, but that is what I've been hearing. Um, next, I am going to play the white-throated sparrow. First, I'm gonna play his song. This is again, one you might hear singing every now and then during the winter time. Very beautiful song to pick out. One of my favorite bird songs. It sounds kind of like people say, oh, sweet Canada, Canada. Sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down. Um, and then their call is a little bit harder to get the hang of, but it's a very distinct uh, chink call. So theirs is kind of aggressive and it definitely takes some practice to really get the hang of it, but they have a very aggressive chink. Um, the dark-eyed junco is one that you'll hear him calling a lot. Sometimes you'll hear one, but a lot of times it's a small flock of several. I'm going to play his calls next. A lot of times I kind of equate that to like an electric Twitter. That's how I think it sounds. Uh, a lot of times you'll hear them before you see them but they're very easy to distinguish from other birds. They've got that dark gray plumage. And then when they're flying away, they like to flash their outer tail feathers, which are white. Next, I'm gonna play the house sparrow. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but the house sparrow to me makes me think of Home Depot. But I think that's because a lot of times that's the bird that will get into those stores who leave their doors wide open. I associate them a lot with uh, urban areas more than I do with forested areas because they are very accustomed to those uh, urban centers. 
Uh, the next guy, next guy I'm going to play is the Song Sparrow. This one's a little uh, difficult to differentiate sometimes from the House Sparrow, but it's a little, it's a little different. So they sound a little similar. I, I think the house sparrow is a little bit higher pitched. So those two can be kind of difficult, but that's where kind of the environment comes into play. House sparrows you'll find more in towns and urban areas, song sparrows you'll find in shrubby forest areas. Getting back to our presentation. Now we're gonna get into some of our finches. Um, on the left, a lot of us probably recognize this guy. This is our American gold finch. Um, this is that example of the non-breeding plumage. This is a male, but he doesn't have that beautiful yellow color that we're so used to seeing. Um, he looks very similar to the females, and most birds will look this way during the winter time. In the center, we have our house finch, and on the right, we have our purple finch. Now, these two look very similar. You might say, oh, you just took the same bird and posted it up there twice, but I didn't. Uh, the way to tell these guys apart is the purple finch on the right, they typically have a lot more red coming down their belly and down their backs onto their wings, and they have a lot less brown streaking. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but a lot less brown streaking on their underside, while the house finch, you can really see those streaks. Uh, house finches are a lot more common at feeders than purple finches, but every now and then you'll get the oddball purple finch. And I am also going to play these guys' calls because they are just very common around here and it's good to kind of get an idea of them. So the American goldfinch, there are two calls that we'll hear most of the time during the winter. This is their typical call. <coughs> to me, that sounds like they're saying, look at me, look at me. You know, they're so beautiful, look at me. But then we'll also hear uh, their flight calls a lot of times. So these guys, it's when they're passing over, you'll hear them in flight, this is the sound they make. Once you get these memorized, you'll hear them all over the place. It's, it's like they're flying over top of us all the time. Next, I'm gonna play the house finch call. His is kind of similar to the American gold finch. I say kind of similar because it's a little raspier, a lot lower, the American gold finch, it's a lot more pure and higher. And then our purple finch has a very unique call. Very easy to pick out from the rest of these guys. Next, we're gonna get into a couple of birds I'm sure all of us recognize. Uh, three of these I know are probably some of our most famous backyard birds. In the top right, we've got our Northern Cardinal. This guy has definitely gotten a lot of people out, started birding. Everyone loves this guy during the winter. Beautiful, beautiful bird in the snow. Um, we'll see them at our feeders. You'll see them in the forests while hiking around. Um, and they have a very high pitched uh, chipping call. Sometimes once you get the hang of what it sounds like, you'll instantly identify them. And that's, this is the example of that uh, dimorphic plumage where the male is that bright red color and the female is that light tan with the warm red accents. Uh, the top left panel, we all recognize the American Robin. A lot of us associate them with spring. A lot of times we see them start showing up on our lawns in the springtime and now we know spring has come but they actually are year round residents. They just kind of retreat into the woods and they'll flock up into little feeding flocks, especially around trees with fruiting bodies, like you can see in this picture. So keep your eyes peeled for these guys. And then in the bottom left, we've got our Eastern bluebirds. Eastern bluebirds are a little bit more rare during the winter, but they have been sticking around. And when they do stick around, a lot of times you'll find them in these small flocks of three or four. I know back home, down in Western New York, we're seeing them stick around during the winter time. My, my mom always texts me every time she sees them. And they, I've definitely been hearing a couple still the past couple of weeks on my point counts. And then the bottom right, this guy's kind of an oddball. Um, I included him because he is in the same family as the Robin and the Eastern Bluebird. He's a hermit thrush. Um, typically we really won't see him. They usually migrate south, but a couple times on the previous counts, people have seen this guy. So this guy's very, easy to distinguish. He's got that streaking breast, and then he also has this rufous uh, colored tail. But we're highly unlikely to see him during the winter, but it's good to know what he looks like just in case we do get the oddball. You'll usually see him deep in the woods. 
Getting into our woodpeckers, I'm sure a lot of us recognize these guys, very, very popular backyard birds, especially the uh, left in the central panels. We've got our downy woodpecker and our hairy woodpecker. The one on the left is a female downy, while the center panel is a male downy. These two species look very, very similar, almost exactly the same. Even the males have, both males have that red patch and both females lack it. The biggest difference between them is size. The hairy woodpeckers are much bigger and I kind of think their beak is a lot more triangular shaped while the downy woodpecker is just a lot smaller. Downies are a lot more common at our feeders while harries will kind of stick to the woods, but harries will show up at our feeders as well. Um, but both of them you can find in the woods and off of trails. In the top right, we've got our Northern Flicker. This is another bird who's kind of been sticking around a lot more during these mild winters. Uh, these are woodpeckers who are kind of unique among the rest of them in that they prefer to forage on the ground rather than drilling into a tree, they prefer to drill into anthills. Um, definitely a lot of fun. I've seen several northern flickers recently in the past couple weeks. They're fun to see in the snow. They've got that beautiful dappled plumage, uh, but usually you find them in the woods or on your lawn. And then in the bottom right, we've got North America's uh, largest woodpecker, the pileated woodpecker. These guys do stick around year round, and typically you won't see them unless you're deep in the woods or you hear their uh, wooking call but very easy to identify if you see one or hear one, especially if they're flying overhead. Very large silhouette and very easy to pick out. Getting into a couple more recognizable guys, we've got our Corvid family. We've got our Blue Jay, American Crow, and Common Raven. We all recognize the Blue Jay. These guys are here year round, a beautiful blue bird, very easy to identify. You'll see them in your backyard, you'll see them in the town, or you'll see them in the woods. Very easy to pick out. Uh, top right, we have our American Crow, while on the bottom right, we have the Common Raven. These guys look very similar and are kind of hard to tell apart uh, if they're by themselves. Uh, common Ravens are larger than American Crows. They have a chunkier beak, kind of shaggier feathers. Uh, but another thing to note is American Crows uh, typically form flocks, while Common Ravens will be more solitary. There might be one or two of them in a pair during the wintertime, uh, but definitely keep your eyes open for these guys. Oh, and we all recognize the American crow's caw. Uh, common ravens typically have a deeper croaking call. And then the bottom left, this is another uh, unique uh, year-round resident. We've got our northern mockingbird. This is in the Mimidae family. These guys are kind of uh, dull looking, but they have these bright white wing patches that they like to flash and show off, but they are more common in kind of urban or suburban areas. They love to stick around yards or shrubbery kind of uh, trimmed uh, fences and gardens, that sort of thing. And they typically are a little more secretive sometimes, not as often seen, but they do stick around during the winter. And then we're getting into some kind of like mix and match groups. Uh, in the top left, I'm sure a lot of us recognize the European starling. And then net right to the right of him is our rock pigeon. These two are non-native species that were introduced way back during colonial times. Uh, but European starlings and rock pigeons have definitely both made themselves at home. Starlings you'll see uh, in huge flocks during the winter time, especially around fruiting trees. And then rock pigeons we typically see in towns under overpasses or you know in those sorts of areas or on green fields. Um, rock pigeons typically look, have this sort of plumage in this image, but a lot of times they can be a mottled brown, black or white, but they are all rock pigeons. Um, but on the top right, we have our native dove, the mourning dove, so named for their mournful call. These guys stick around during the winter as well, sometimes in small flocks. They'll show up at feeders if you've got a platform feeder, or they try to get onto your other feeders when they don't fit and they just kind of fall off. It's okay. But these guys are pretty easy to uh, recognize, especially if you know their call. Uh, our bottom three panels, starting from the left, we've got our snow bunting. Uh, the center bottom is the horned lark, and then the bottom right is our Lapland longspur. These are a couple more of those winter migrants. We don't see them during summer. They come down here, and we only see them during winter. These guys, uh, wherever you are in your uh, bird counts, they typically occupy large fields like um, trimmed cornfields or just big open areas. You really won't find them in the woods. 
A lot of times if you see uh, lots of little movement on the ground, it's probably one of these three guys. Sometimes they do flock together. The horned lark, I will note in this picture, you can't see it here, but they do have a couple set, a little set of black horns you'll see uh, erected sometimes. But um, these guys are definitely unique and fun to see during the winter time because we don't get to see them any other time. So now we're gonna get into a couple of other passerines, the, that winter finch forecast I mentioned earlier. So these guys are birds we may see one year and we won't see them the next. It all depends on those uh, conifer resources up north. So the 2021 forecast is kind of 50-50. Last year we had evening grosbeaks and pine siskins, but this year there's a possibility for some, but then there's the unlikelihood for others. So we may see the white winged crossbill. We likely will see some red crossbills. Someone might find them. Typically we find them every year. Uh, purple finches we usually find every year. Not too many, but we do. The evening grosbeaks, they were mentioning we might have an echo flight from last year, and that's just because they did so well the previous year. We might see some come this far south this year. Um, the unlikely birds we'll see this year is probably the pine grosbeak, the pine siskin, although a couple were found on eBird, but not too many, um, are red poles, and then that bohemian waxwing. So to kind of put names to faces, on the left, we've got our red crossbill. This is one guy that I'm sure someone will find this year on the Christmas bird count. I sure hope so. That'd be a lot of fun. I've never seen one, so maybe I'll find it. That'll be awesome. <laughs> but on the right next to him in this kind of second to the right is our pine siskin. Uh, this guy we're less likely to see this year alongside our red poles. We likely won't see them. If we do, all three of these guys definitely visit backyard feeders or they'll kind of stick to the woods. They love those conifer trees. The common red pole and the hoary red pole look pretty similar. The obvious difference is that kind of red on the common red pole and then the hoary red pole, so named for the hoarfrost uh, plumage, like up north, that beautiful hoarfrost, it's very white. These guys are a lot less common than the common red poles, however, but they will flock up together occasionally. And then below him, the bottom right, we've got our evening grosbeak. This is that guy that showed up in force last year. Uh, very easy bird to identify. Uh, right next to him, we've got our pine grosbeak. Unlikely to see him this year, but even though he looks very similar to the white wing crossbill to the left of him, the crossbills have this unique crossbill, as they're so named, that kind of sets them apart. All these guys you'll usually find in the woods. They prefer those deep conifer stands but when you do walk into a flock of them, you know you're there. And then on the left here, we've got our cedar waxwing and the, on the right, we've got our bohemian waxwing. The cedar waxwing we see year, year round. He isn't included in the winter finch forecast, but I chose to put him alongside the bohemian because they look so similar. The bohemian uh, is different in that he's got those yellow markings, those yellow and white markings in his uh, wing feathers but he also has this uh, nice orange red patch under his tail feathers. The cedar waxwing does not have that. We're unlikely to see the bohemian waxwings this year though. However, cedar waxwings typically do have large feeding flocks in the winter. You'll hear them calling their high-pitched sea calls, especially in fruiting trees. So now we're gonna kind of continue on with a couple more winter birds. Uh, we started out with a lot of songbirds, so now we're gonna get more into like our owls and our hawks and all that. So starting off with the owls, a lot of us probably recognize the guy on the left. This is our barred owl. We see him all year round. Very, very common sight in the woods around here. I'm sure someone will hopefully see one this year. Um, in the center, we have our long-eared owl. And top right, we have the great horned. Bottom right, we have the northern sawwit. So these guys are actually here all year round. It's just they're diurnal, which means they usually hunt at night. So they kind of hide during the day. So they can be very difficult to find on these Christmas bird counts if we're only looking for them during the day. It is possible to find them. Long-eared owls will kind of stick way up in tall pines. They'll stay close to the trunk, but they are very uh, perceptive. If you get kind of too close to them, a lot of times they'll see you before they see them and they'll take off. Northern sawwits are very small. They're just difficult to find, but if you look for, uh, say, hemlocks or other pine trees, they typically will hug uh, right up next to the trunk, but they are very difficult to find despite having kind of that nice brown plumage. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. 
And then we've got our great horned owl. This guy is very common around here, but again, typically they hunt at night and they're kind of difficult to find during the day. Now we're gonna get into our accipiters. Um, in the right side, the top right, we have our Northern goshawk. This is a very big uh, predatory bird, forest hunter. So we'll see him in the woods during the winter time occasionally. Very unique plumage, sets him apart from all these other guys. Right next to him, we have our red-tailed hawk. This guy is kind of uh, an open woodlands occupier. We'll find him in the woods or kind of in those semi-open areas. A lot of times we'll find him on the roadsides, on telephone poles, sunning themselves. We all recognize red-tailed hawks. They've got that beautiful red tail. Below them, we've got two more uh, forest hunters. So we'll find them in the woods. On the right, we have, <laughs> on the left, we have our Cooper's hawk. And on the right, we have the sharp shin hawk. I put them in the same picture because as you can see, they look very, very similar. The biggest difference between them is their size. Um, coming back up to these other guys, right here is another uh, example of a winter migrant, the rough-legged hawk. These guys will only see during the winter time and they prefer grasslands. So if anyone's out by a farm field or a very open area, keep your eyes peeled for a rough-legged hawk. They are so named because their feathers do extend all the way down to their toes unlike on the red-tailed hawk where you see he's got his bare legs. So those are our accipiters. Uh, to the right of the rough-legged hawk, we have our falcon, the uh, American kestrel. This is our smallest falcon in North America. They do stick around year-round, a uh, little less common sight to see, but if you're in an open area or kind of a partially open uh, field or woodland, you might see a pair of these sticking around. And then in the bottom right, we have our bald eagle. These guys have definitely become a lot more common in recent years. Typically you find them in deep forests alongside some water body, but I have been seeing them kind of in oddball spots out in the open or really far away from the water. But we all recognize them. We, they've got their bright white head, their bright white tail. Uh, juveniles though, we do know um, will have a mottled white and brown look, but I'm sure a lot of us can pick them out very easily. And now we're gonna get into kind of our uh, water species. Most birds kind of head south or to the coastline, but these guys you may or may not see if you're near a pond or a river or say um, a field. A lot of times you'll find a lot of ring-billed gulls in the field. Uh, the ring-billed gull is in this top center panel. This is his non-breeding plumage. They kind of have this uh, dappled look on their head. And then on the left is the herring gull a much larger bird than the ring-billed, but just as common as uh, the ring-billed, I would say. And they do come inland, so you might see them every now and then. Top right, we've got our Canada goose. These guys are very easy to identify. I'm sure some of us will see them uh, sticking around some pond somewhere or a grassland nearby, especially with this weird melty weather we've had, although hopefully we're getting snow this Saturday. Um, in the bottom left and bottom center panels, We've got our uh, American black-tailed duck and the uh, mallard. These guys, I'm, I know most of us will recognize, definitely stick around on open water. If there is any, uh, keep your eyes peeled for them. And then the bottom right, we've got our belted kingfisher. Unless you're alongside a river somewhere, you may or may not see him. Uh, we have had, I think we've had a couple show up on some of our accounts, but he's a little less common because you do kind of have to go to those uh, specialized areas to see them. And then finally, we've got kind of our game birds. So we've got the wild turkey on the left and our ruffed grouse on the right. Wild turkeys, I'm sure someone will see them on the Christmas bird count. Ruffed grouse um, are very common, but they're very secretive. A lot of times you won't know you're walking near one until you step on one and it kind of skitters away under your feet. But definitely uh, keep your eyes on the lookout for these guys in the woods. Uh, turkeys, you'll, a lot of times you'll see out in the open in big groups, but either way, kind of hard to find sometimes. And finally, we're gonna get into some uncommon species. So these guys are, we're a lot less likely to see, but we have had them show up on some counts in previous years. So I'm just gonna mention them kind of in passing, not gonna go into too much detail because they are a lot less common. Excuse me. So starting off with a couple of uh, songbirds and woodpeckers on the left, we've got our yellow-bellied sapsucker, very, very common during the spring and summer. Typically they go south, but they have been lingering during these uh, warmer winters. We've had a couple being caught on counts. Um, very unique look though. Um, the other woodpecker up here in the center, pant, the top center is the red-bellied woodpecker. 
A lot less common than the yellow-bellied sapsucker, but we have had one every now and then. Our Carolina wren in the top right. These guys have an odd habit of expanding and decreasing their range during these mild winters. They've kind of slowly been encroaching in the north, uh, but if we get a bad winter, they'll kind of disappear for a couple of years. And then below, we've got two sparrows. We've got our chipping sparrow in the center panel, and then on the right, we have our fox sparrow. Every now and then, we'll catch a couple of these guys on the counts. They're kind of oddballs. Couple more species. Um, the guy on the left is a Canada jay. This is another one of those boreal species alongside the sage grouse in the top center panel. These guys will find in those boreal forests. Um, typically, you won't see them in lower elevations, but if you do head up a little bit higher, you're pretty likely to see these guys, especially the sage grouse. I think they're pretty common on counts who uh, those higher elevations. Top right, we have uh, the ring-necked pheasant, and below him is the snow goose. These guys typically op uh, occupy open fields. Ring-necked pheasants will go into the woods, but snow geese you'll typically find um, in very open areas. They're very uncommon, the snow geese, but we have had several small groups of them show up on counts. And then in the bottom center panel, we've got our northern shrike. So these guys are those uh, songbirds that have the uh, diet of a predator. And they prefer kind of shrubby, semi-open areas. Every now and then we do get one of these guys on counts. And then getting into a couple more water species, we recognize our great blue heron on the top left. Next to him is the wood duck. Uh, and then right next to him is the northern pintail. These guys, again, depending on their habits, wood ducks typically you'll find in the woods. Northern pintails you can find on ponds or on the coast which we don't have a coastline in our count area, but they do come inland sometimes. And below them, we've got our mergansers. We have our hooded merganser and the common merganser. They do stick around here year round, but they're kind of secretive. So keep your eyes open. If you're nearby like a little lake or a little river, you might see them. And then our one oddball uh, uh, songbird on the bottom left is the swamp sparrow. These guys prefer wetland areas. So if you're nearby a wetland or a pond, they may show up on one of your counts. So in the end, the biggest thing about this, these Christmas bird counts is you can be anyone from an amateur birder to an expert birder. The biggest thing is to have fun. We're out here to count birds because we want to help protect them. We all have a passion for bird, birds in some shape or form. Um, again, winter birding is my favorite time to go birding. I love the birds who stick around during the winter time. Uh, they kind of keep the woods a little lively when they're very quiet. Uh, I have a couple images in here of my dark-eyed junco. The one below him is a dark-eyed junco alongside an American tree sparrow. And then I've got my downy woodpecker up here who looks like he's playing hide and seek in a picture. And then a couple of these images are from Audubon. Most of the images in this presentation were from Audubon, especially during the bird ID section. But again, we want to have fun. We want to go out there and help uh, conservationists protect these birds. So hopefully we can all have a nice snow day this Saturday so we can enjoy it. Uh, but in the end, I just want to thank everyone for um, sitting through this. I know it's kind of later in the evening. I hope you guys enjoyed, and I am ready to take any questions we might have had. All right. Awesome, Katie. Thank you so much. Um, if folks looking through, because I think it was um, uh, just comments on the... the um, the audio, but if folks have um, any questions for Katie about any of the birds or what she said, um, or honestly, if anyone has had any um, any good bird sightings, um, we would love to hear it because it's it's so funny that I've heard such a range in terms of folks putting their feeders out from like people getting lots and lots of activity and really great birds to uh, like at our house, like our feeders out and the birds, you know, really only the squirrels are utilizing it um, at this point. Or, you know, and at Tin Mountain, we still have, you know, it's been so mild and such funky weather that we've got bears utilizing our, our feeders. Um, you know, at night and we've started pulling them in. So um, if anyone, you are welcome to unmute yourself and ask, um, you know, any questions um, or if you just want to share 
um, you know, share any any good sightings you've seen at your house house or elsewhere. Oh, so here is a question for you. Uh, here's a question, Katie. Is the reason um, that, you know, with some of the eruptives, so say the Bohemians, you know, is the reason that they're not expected here this year due primarily due to food sources? Yes. So again, with these eruptive species, they do uh, come this far south based on food resources up north. So this year, a lot of the spruce crops and other conifer species, it was a good year up north. So they'll kind of stick you know, up in the northern range. They won't really come this far south because the food is so good up there. When they come far, this far south, it's because the food is very scarce up north, and then they'll head down south in search of food. Um, all right, great. And um, Tom, if, if you want to ask the second part of your question, you are welcome to unmute yourself. <laughs> Uh, uh, Katie, can you see the question? I I see the chat. He he's asking you to pronounce a word so you can tell. Oh wait, me. yes. So okay, I have the chat up. Oh, oh, oh no. Oh no. Um. <laughs> and I'm I'm totally teasing here because it's it's weird. But I have I got it's Worcestershire. <laughs> right? No. No, <laughs> no <laughs> Katie. <laughs> Wait, how is it pronounced then? <laughs> oh my It's pronounced Worcester. Oh my gosh. I know my face is getting red on camera for this. <laughs> no hives, Katie. No hives. No hives. <laughs> All right. Oh. Tom, just for that, if it rains and we cancel the bird count, I'm gonna make sure you're not on that email. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll I'll go count anyway. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right. Um, so, so the other thing um, is that, as I said, I know a number of you um, are already, that we already have you signed up to participate. Um, if there's anyone who has not talked to Katie Lewis or myself or one of the other area leaders about participating in the bird count on Saturday, and that's something you are interested in doing, um, we are also happy, um, you know, happy to talk to you about that. Um, if there's anyone who is interested in that, we are always happy to have more feeder counters. If you happen to live in the area, in the count peer area um, and have a bird feeder, or, um, you know, we have a number of locations that you can, um, you know, either count on your own, uh, give you a little spot to count on your own, or you can join a group that's counting if you're more, you know, depending what your comfort level is at this, at this stage. That was really good. And, and I, I like the, uh, the presentation of your photos was really, really good. It was crisp oh. and clean and uh, excellent. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Again, most of them came from Audubon. I do not have pictures of every single bird, sadly, in the world. I will get there eventually, <laughs> though. <laughs> I, have a, I have a question. Katie, what are you most hoping to see on Saturday for, at the CBC? I'm most hoping to see, so I didn't say this earlier, but I have actually never heard of the Christmas bird count until I came to Tin Mountain, which is odd for a bird nerd like myself, but back home, they're not very, uh, oh, what's the word? They don't advertise it very well. Anyways, I definitely hope to see some of these winter finches because they don't really come down where I am, even though this year is kind of a, you may see some, you may not. I really hope to see at least something a red pole or or a, a crossbill i've never seen a crossbill before that'd be really fun what about you katie the why what are you hoping to see this year I, yeah well i mean last year with the eruptive finches i didn't get evening gross beaks or or pine gross beaks but i think it would be cool to get um like a shrike or something. One of those like, you know, possibilities, but that's not super common. I think that would be cool. Mm -hmm. It's definitely nice 
with these Christmas bird counts, it's spread over such a wide area. You have all these habitats that someone does see one of these unique birds. It's just not everyone gets to see them because it all depends on the habitat you're going through. So like the boreal areas, I would love to see a boreal chickadee or a Canada jay, but we'd have to go up higher yeah. for that. Oh, it's your question. Yeah, the fellow that had all the evening grow speaks up on Hurricane Mountain Road hasn't seen him this year at all. Oh, was... yes. So, Tom, I was hearing, we heard earlier today about the, your contact on Hurricane Mountain Road, and we heard that you, you also have a fabulous eagle photo from that. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I should yes, have copied you on that. I'll send, photo. You. I'll send it to you too, Katie. And uh, I don't have yes, uh, Katie Gerlinger's email, but can we do it without the it's picture. just a wacky yeah. picture. I'll send it right now. Oh, great. Yeah, I can forward it on to Katie. Katie, too, also. Katie, I. Katie with an I. <laughs> Katie with an I and Katie with a Y. No. We're streamlining all of our departments at Chip Mountain. <laughs> all <laughs> the same name. <laughs> Yes. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us, Katie. Thank you for, for presenting. And we hope to see or hear um, You've heard her before. from, from folks this one? I never saw her before. Mm -hmm. With their, uh, you know, hoping to, you know, to have as many of you participate as possible.